Um, but let it just gives me just such great joy to introduce my my very old and dear colleague, Linda Mearns, who is a senior scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, known as NCAR. She heads the Regional Integrated Sciences Collective and the Regional Climate Uncertainty Program, both things I'm very interested uh, to hear more about. Um, she has participated as a lead author or coordinating lead author in all the IPCC assessments since 1995. Very, very strong contributions to IPCC all the way along. Um, her science focuses on formation of regional climate change scenarios for application to adaptation. Uh, uncertainty is she's one of the leaders and thinking about uncertainty in regional climate change so important for adaptation and also for the engagement of society that that will put that 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 challenging uh, issue of uncertainty and um, and and as well on um, on impacts on agriculture so Linda welcome and over to you for you for your lecture on uh, downscaling one of the key elements in methods of the work of impacts and adaptation. So thank you so much. Over to you. Thanks very much, Cynthia. And it's uh, indeed a pleasure to be here with uh, so many old friends and new, and um, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, let's see, I have to share my screen. Let's see if we can do this. Nishka and I practiced this earlier just to make sure it works, because we all know how things can go wrong. And I'll, I, I remember, not many of you will remember that we used to use overheads as opposed to PowerPoint, but there was a period when the technology for using PowerPoint was, mm, let's say, iffy. And so what one tended to do was bring the overheads, plastic sheets, along with the PowerPoints in case things didn't work out. And I very much remember uh, Cynthia and I doing that for a particular uh, conference. So um, yes, interesting times if you go back far enough. All right, let's see, sharing my screen. Looks good. Share. Voila. Great. We see. And it screen. says, Mark, participate can now see the application. All right, I'll go into production mode. And let me also say that, um, you know, I've also known Roger for a rather long time. Um, believe it or not, you know, 30 years ago, we did not all have gray hair. Um, Things have changed, um, David as well. So Roger, following Roger, Roger is a hard act to follow. Let me start with saying that. And also our presentations are, are quite different. What I'm providing you with is something more of a, not a, well, it's somewhat technical about providing downscaled climate information which can figure into a lot of the, uh, the systems work that Roger was referring to. So um, downscaling is basically, we're referring to methods for generating, um, sorry, let me just put on my, start my timer so I know where I am in time, okay. Um, so downscaling are what methods for generating higher spatial resolution, in this case, climate information from lower resolution information. And uh, why do we need that? Well, for two reasons. Um, the objections of downscaling are include resolving high resolution processes that are responsible for uh, generating regional climate. And this is known as the added value of um, downscaling. And then there's also a second reason, which is to bridge the mismatch of spatial scales between that of global climate models and the resolutions needed for impacts and adaptation assessments. 
And there are basically two different kinds that I'm going to discuss today. Um, statistical downscaling, which is basically uh, developed by forming statistical relationships between large scale atmospheric phenomena and local climate variables of interest, for example, temperature and precipitation. Um, and then the, the dynamical approach is one in which you're actually using a climate model um, over a just a part and a region of the earth, but you're resolving basically um, the dynamics of the climate system. And then there's also a stretched grid approach, which I'll say a little bit about. And then there have been some experiments with um, hybrid approaches. So, uh, come on, there we go. Uh, so quite frankly, I, for various reasons that I'll explain, I'm actually gonna be talking a lot about results from regional climate models. And so I'm going to describe the technique for producing regional climate model scenarios. Basically, you use a high resolution model, for example, in this picture, um, this region over Europe, with these little dots being the spatial grid. And it's embedded, the regional model is embedded into the global model. And by embedded, I mean that the global model provides initial conditions for the run, the soil moisture, sea surface temperatures, sea ice, and then the lateral meteorological conditions uh, temperature, humidity, uh, pressure, and so forth um, to drive the model. And it, the global model provides the large scale response to the forcing of forcing such as greenhouse gas, increased greenhouse gases. And then the regional model at this higher resolution provides finer scale responses on the orders of 10 kilometers or finer. So to give you a better feel for what these different resolutions look like, um, global models tend to be run, of course, the resolution has increased over time. Um, models are generally at a higher resolution than 400 kilometers, somewhere between, let's say about 200 to 100 kilometers at this point, depending upon how long of a run you want. And then, so this indicates the topography of the US at these different resolutions. And you can see a very distinct difference between uh, these, these images that show it from a global model point of view. And then a regional model, which could be run at anywhere from let's say 50 to 25 kilometers, here's 25 kilometers. And here we go down to 10 kilometers. Um, and you can very clearly see um, the difference in how well the topography is resolved. And of course, just resolving the topography makes a big difference because the topography makes a big difference in terms of uh, how the atmosphere behaves. There's also, and this is becoming somewhat more possible, more um, popular, this stretched grid modeling approach in which you do use a full global model, but you increase the resolution over a particular area of interest. And here we have one um, where the resolution gets much higher over the US, uh, particularly in the central part. And so you have a full model and there are specific um, advantages to that, but then you also get this higher resolution in the area that you're particularly interested in. So there's this big issue in climate, regional climate modeling in particular, and that is the issue of the added value. In other words, these running regional models, they are computation, computationally expensive, and you tend to have to make choices about the number of different uh, driving models that um, are used to drive the regional climate models. So it's very important to demonstrate like, well, we really get better information 
when we use higher resolution. So here's a classic study done by my colleague, Filippo Giorgi and his colleagues showing um, these, a series of results from global models here on the left for different time periods going from a relatively early period out to about 2070 to 20, um, 2100 in the lower panels. And then on the right, you see the results from regional models that have been driven by this suite of global models. And what we can see here is very different signals of changes in precipitation. So this is looking at change in precipitation um, for three different time slices going into the future. And the main difference that you see here is that in the collection of regional models, this is the average response of a number of them, you'll see that along the Alps across Northern Italy, um, you'll see precipitation increases that continue even into the, the latter part of the century. And it's been demonstrated that the response of the regional model showing this increase um, along the Alps is actually, for one thing, more consistent with observations. And it also makes sense from the point of view that what the regional model is able to resolve is this enhanced summer convective rainfall. This, these are, images are from the summer season. And um, this enhanced convective rainfall is partially due to the better resolution of the topography and of the processes of convection. And so there's every reason to believe that although you'd see general drying in the summer um, around the Mediterranean area, that you would see these areas of increased precipitation along, in this case, the Alps. And so this is a, a very nice study that really shows the added value and shows that the results, especially as we go further out to the 21st century, that this response from the global model is um, not as credible as the response from the regional model. So this is a very nice study that really clearly demonstrates the added value of going, of using uh, regional models. Now, I hasten to add, now that I've showed you that great demonstration, I hasten to add that you don't always get better results with uh, higher resolution. So here's a, an example of some work by my colleague, Melissa Bukowski. Um, and she did some runs over the Southwest US and the North American monsoon runs driven by the NCAR global model, the CCSM. And she did two different resolutions, 50 kilometers and 10 kilometer resolution. And what you see here in this image is the trace of observations where you see the high amount of precipitation in uh, late July, August, and into September, which is monsoon precipitation. And in both cases, the regional model run at both resolutions did an, does an amazingly poor job of reproducing the North American monsoon. In other words, going from 50 kilometers to 10 kilometers gets you pretty much nothing. Um, and why is that? And this has to do with the fact that in this particular global model, the boundary conditions were essentially fatally flawed, in which case the higher resolution is not going to be able to make up for those fatal flaws. So you really need to have high quality and credible boundary conditions for driving the regional model. Now, what I'm gonna spend a good part of today on is um, describing these CORDEX simulations that were assessed in the IPCC Working Group One report. And, um, this is quite something because it covers 
all regions of the world were used, regional models were used over all regions of the world with multiple simulations using different regional and global models. And the resolutions varied uh, by region. For example, Europe I was able to do them at 12 kilometer resolution. Africa tended to be at about 50 kilometers. And all of these results uh, were presented in the IPCC Working Group 1 report um, in the Atlas chapter of which I was an author and in the interactive Atlas. And this is the first time that regional models have been run all across all land areas in the world and have been completely assessed in an IPCC report. And this shows you the Cordex domain. Uh, Cordex, by the way, is the coordinated regional downscaling experiment um, developed initially by my colleague, Filippo Giorgi. And so we see uh, the different domains over all the regions. One of the nice things about the Cordex program is that it really emphasized um, making sure that there was sufficient coverage of Africa in terms of um, regional modeling results, understanding that Africa, from the point of view of climate change, is one of the more vulnerable regions with a number of vulnerable populations. And um, so there was a real emphasis of making sure that Africa was completely covered. But ultimately, all regions uh, were covered in the Cortex program. So I'm now going to show you some results. Um, first from NA Cortex, the North American um, Regional Climate Modeling Program, uh, of which I am the co-chair. And I'm just going to show you, point out some things about the results. Um, so here we have results from two different regional climate models, the REG-CM and WARF at two different spatial resolutions, 25 kilometers and 50 kilometers, and driven by three different global models. And these global models differ based on how, uh, shall we say, reactive the models are to the forcing of increased greenhouse gases. And this also is based on a relatively high uh, greenhouse gas scenario, the RCP 8.5. And these models were all driven by the CMIP-5 collection of global models. So what we see here is we see a lot of this regional detail, um, some if it greater at 25 kilometers. This is for temperature. You also see that the change in temperature from the current out to the second half of the century um, intensifies based on which global model is driving the regional models. And this difference is based on the climate sensitivity of the global models. In other words, how reactive the global model is to the increased forcing. So um, we can see that there are important differences across the, the driving models and that we see different regional details at 50 versus 25 kilometers. For example, this, this hot spot at 25 kilometers with the reg CM. But basically uh, you'll see that for temperature, which is kind of a large scale variable, the regional modeling results are very much um, affected by the boundary conditions from the global model. So this is just to show you what a, a series of these simulations look at, like. Um, with precipitations, pr precipitation is a highly spatial variable. variable. And this shows sort of a similar diagram to the one I showed you before, but this shows the response of the actual individual GCM in the top row. 
And then the Wharf and Reg CM uh, results, I think at 25 kilometers. And here is again to just point out some of the differences. So you tend to see the same tendency with the GCMs um, and the regional models of this, this is for annual mean precipitation of this general increase in precipitation towards the north, and that's a pretty robust result, and then decreases as we move down into the southwest area. But we see different patterns, both in the GCMs and then also particularly in the regional models. And so, for example, one of the differences is uh, this high increase in precipitation along the upper west coast, which you don't get in the GCMs because they're not really resolving uh, the topography up there, which is going to cause an increase in precipitation. And then you'll see different patterns of this drying um, in the regional models compared to um, the global models. So this just gives you a feel for the types of details you can get from regional climate models. Um, and this of course would make a difference if you were using these results for um, using impacts models such as crop models, hydrological models and so forth. Now I said that one of the important uh, features of this cortex, these cortex experiments uh, was the emphasis on Africa. So here we see the results from Africa from 23 regional climate models, again, driven by different um, global models. Again, this is the high, a high um, greenhouse gas concentration scenario. And I'll just point out a couple of the features here that we see um, precip decreases particularly in Southern Africa in June, July, August, where you see these tripes in, going in this direction, that's that the change is robust. And we see that in June, July, August, and also September, October, November, um, indicating that this area could become particularly vulnerable with decreased precipitation. We also see periods of increase in East Africa in December, January, and February, uh, particularly. So, and these particular changes have been established as being robust based on the, an analysis of the, the processes that are driving these changes in precipitation. Here's another example from Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia is just such a great example of an area in which having higher resolution is just paramount because you can't resolve land areas that are this complex and that are high resolution themselves without using a regional climate model. What we see here are um, two different concentration pathways, the kind of medium road 4.5 and the higher 8.5. The top is for December, January, February. The bottom is for um, June, July, August. And I just want to point out a couple of things that we do see for December, January, February, we see increases in a lot of Southeast Asia, but in the island areas, we see, for example, Borneo, uh, we see slight decreases uh, in precipitation, but this becomes particularly intense um, in the late century where the drying becomes much more striking. But let's look at this little area of Borneo, and we see that with the higher resolution, we actually get an area on the windward side of the island where we have increases in precipitation and then drying on the other side. And this is the, these are the types of changes that you really need higher resolution um, to get. So, um, I encourage you, if you're interested in regional modeling results, to look at the atlas chapter in the Working Group 1 report. There's also a great interactive atlas where you can go in and look at results from the CMIP-5, CMIP-6, both sets of global models, as well as the Cordex set of um, regional climate modeling results. And um, 
yeah, I can just say that this was really a, a, a very successful um, program to have these models, high resolution models um, developed and run over all land areas. Now, most of the model results I showed you were run at somewhere around, let's say between 50 and 12 kilometers. Um, one can go to even higher resolutions and some would argue that that's absolutely necessary. So one of the earliest researchers, researchers to go down to a 1.5 kilometer resolution model, for example, was Lizzie Kendon at the UK Met Office. And this is from her paper demonstrating that for, um, for precipitation and for precipitation um, on a daily time scale or actually hourly, this is in millimeters, millimeters per hour. Um, this is for summer. This is comparing results from a 12 kilometer run of the UK Met Office regional model versus a 1.5 kilometer model. Um, and this is showing the top shows the biases from a collection of years of runs. Um, and you see, first of all, that the biases in the 12 kilometer run um, are, are quite large and there are decreases or under predictions. And the results for the um, 1.5 kilometer model, there are fewer of them and they tend to be increases. And this is for extreme precipitation. And why are we concerned with extreme precipitation? Because very often um, impacts are most severe under conditions of extreme precipitation. And we have many examples of um, serious flooding in various parts of the world um, from extreme precipitation. Now, the other thing is if you look at the change from a period, let's say 10 years out of the century versus present day, uh, we can see that the difference is very, very striking. Um, and that we see larger and many more changes in extreme precipitation um, with the 1.5 kilometer resolution. At 1.5 kilometer, one of the most important things that happens is that convection is explicitly modeled convection, which you know, is a process by which you know, heat is transferred by movement of heated fluid such as air or water um, up through the atmosphere. Um, and Kendon and colleagues conclude that for looking at extreme precipitation, you really need to use a convection resolving model. Um, that's a very important point and demonstrating this was very important, but there are some constraints um, mainly computational ones in terms of whether or not one can run um, a whole suite of models at 1.5 kilometers. Okay, one more feature about precipitation. This is a study by my colleague Andreas Prine and colleagues from 2015, and I'll just show you um, one example of these results for the summer, once again in Switzerland, and he ran models that uh, showed that with higher resolution, let's say two kilometers, you can reproduce the daily cycle of precipitation, which can be uh, quite important, again, in terms of precipitation extremes by running in this case, a two kilometer regional climate model, which matches the observational cycle um, daily much better than the um, 12 kilometer model. So there've been a lot of experiments showing the, desire of get, the desirability of getting to convection resolving scales. All right, now I'm gonna switch gears and say something about um, statistical modeling 
And here's a great study from my colleague, Ethan Gutman and his colleagues. This shows a bunch of different types of statistical downscaling um, compared to observations across different spatial scales. These are HUC, which are hydrologic units. HUC2 is a most coarsest spatial resolution um, for a fairly large area, um, looking at the Northwest and the Central Rockies. Um, and this is for extreme precipitation. The 50 year return period. And here we have the result for observations and then these various um, statistical downscaling methods. Um, what's important here is that these statistical methods, as I said, are developed um, usually relating large scale atmospheric features to statistically to a local. Um, variable like precipitation of importance. But they're usually done based on, you know, maybe monthly precipitation. So a good test is how well they do on something like extremes when they weren't necessarily um, developed specifically for extremes. And um, a lot of this work has been done for running hydrologic models. Um, and so a lot of the early tests of different methods was done using hydrologic models. Now, I don't really have time to go through all the different methods here, um, but just to say they are different statistical methods. Um, and you can see that, let's say for the Northwest, they don't do, some of them do not too bad, like in this case, the BCSD method bias correction and spatial disaggregation method. Um, but it also depends on the region because in the Central Rockies, uh, rather the BCCA bias correction uh, climate analog approach tends to do better. So you can see that um, it very much depends what method to use also depends upon what aspects of the climate change you're most interested in. Now, this is a very, a very complicated and ugly, quite frankly, um, diagram. I just wanted to show this. This is done by uh, Jose Gutierrez and colleagues for this program, Value, um, a massive program that was done over Europe. And needless to say, I'm not gonna go through these details. This is really just to show you the variety of statistical methods that there are. All of these methods on the um, X axis are different statistical methods. Um, and then this is showing the biases of these different methods for these different regions. And so uh, this was a massive study um, showing that there's certainly variability across the methods, but all of these methods do better than the raw um, coarser model results that are shown here over on the left. Now, I wanted to show you one example of a, some newer methods. Uh, and this is a, an example of work with a machine learning technique uh, known as conv convolutional neural nets. And this is done by a colleague in my group, colleagues in my group, Seth McGinnis and Daniel Coratina. And this is just showing you an example here are observations for one day Tmax, for Tmax um, for one day in December. Here are the observations from GridMet. Here is the neural net downscaling. And this is a scale of temperatures. Um, and then here's a result from the, a regional climate model. And you can see that compared to observations, there is this general tendency to have um, the latitudinal gradient of temperature reproduced, but neither the regional model nor the convolutional neural net uh, reproduces the observations perfectly. And then of course, life gets more complicated with 
precipitation. Um, but again, you see this general tendency um, with the convolutional neural nets to get of a pattern roughly correct. Um, the reg CM has something of a harder time getting the pattern correct. So I want to give you an overview of um, what are the pluses and minuses of the dynamical and statistical downscaling techniques. And this is, uh, this is quite important in terms of what you can practically use. So one thing, the dynamical methods generate many climate variables, uh, winds, relative humidity, solar radiation, um, every variable you could possibly want to use for an impacts or adaptation study. Whereas very often the empirical statistical uh, downscaling only generates a limited number of variables, particularly temperature and precipitation. A big difference and a very important practical difference is that the dynamical downscaling is computationally very expensive. Um, whereas the empirical statistical has its in computational demands are much more limited. And this makes a tremendous difference in terms of what results can be generated and used. Um, in general, the statistical techniques that a bias correction is somewhat incorporated into the methods, whereas dynamical downscaling, an additional step of bias correcting the results that you want to use is necessary. Um, you have to have observations in the area where you want to apply statistical downscaling, and you don't need it in um, the case of dynamical downscaling. And a very important difference is that with the statistical downscaling, you have to assume stationarity. And by that, I mean that you have to assume that the relationships you develop with observations from the global model um, and the temperature and precipitation are interested in, that it holds true for the future. Whereas you're less constrained by that kind of stationarity assumption um, in when it comes to dynamical downscaling. And this is taken from this volume, Cotamarty et al, 2021. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Lin Linda, if you could please yeah. wrap up. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so, Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I, you know, I carefully timed this and then you know uh, what happens. I know, um, always, always, always. Um, see what you can I, do, I'm, thanks. I'm absolutely almost done. So I just want to show you a study that does a comparison of dynamical versus statistical. And this is this great study done in, in China by uh, Tang and colleagues. And I'll just show you an example of this is standard statistical downscaling method up here for the summer. This is a change in, um, whoops, sorry. Change in temperature. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, rather it's uh, precipitation. Um, using a regional model and a statistical downscaling approach. And essentially the point here is just that you see opposite results in the Western part of China. You see increases in the dynamical and the decreases in the statistical. And why is that? We're still working on this problem, and it's really it's really kind of sad that we're still working on it because this point, this problem, or the importance of understanding the difference in downscaling methods has no, been known for a long time. So here's from a National Academy study. Uh, although different approaches to achieving high resolution in climate models have been explored for more than two decades, so that was two decades back in 2012, and we need but there remains a need for more systematic evaluation and comparison of various downscaling methods and to particularly understand why they are different. In other words, which results are more credible? And um, there has been work 
done on this. We have made progress, but I would say not as much as we wanted to. And now a little advertisement of this um, book on downscaling of which I'm an author um, published by Cambridge University Press next year. And I would recommend you take a look at this um, if you're interested in more of the details of downscaling. And finally, many of you are in New York. I'm from New York. Here's my favorite cartoon about climate warming. I just wanna let you know, here's the Empire State Building, that this level of um, sea level rise is physically impossible. Um, so New York will never get to this point, especially if decent adaptation is um, put together. And I know New York is a leader in this. So that's it. I'm sorry I've run on over a no little bit. No worries. Linda, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Uh, just so um, providing just a real deep dive into downscaling, which is so fundamental to so much of the impacts work. And it's so it's really important to lift the hood and really see what goes on. So thank you so lift much. The and by hood. the way, on this New Yorker no, on cartoon, have you calculated if all if West Antarctic and Greenland go we, we should let's we should yes. add, let's add yes. let's add the, the um an actual projection if if uh, both west antarctic and uh, greenland ice sheets actually no. i i've made the actual calculation as to in order to reach this level on the empire state building um what would have to be melted and it would all have to be melted and it's it would all be yeah every level. single thing yep. so, to, yeah so great so i often think i need to go to the new yorker and say that we should. This image is, <laughs> it's is a great idea. One of, one of hysteria. Right, we, it's a great idea. But let me turn to Manishka, who's going to moderate. We uh, we have at least one mm -hmm. question, uh, two questions for you from Alan Robach. I think we would like oh, to take those God. two questions. Alan <laughs> yes. Robach. And okay. then we do want we have some authors um, uh, uh, who have joined, uh, the webinar and we are, that we'd like to have something of a, of, 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 uh, not a panel discussion, but a, 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 an op more open discussion. So, sure. but first questions for you, Linda, over to you, Manishka. Sure. Thanks, Alan, for your question. So Alan Robock has two questions. One is, does Cordex have plans to use climate intervention scenarios to look at regional impacts? And then the next question is, do Cordex models include crop and ecosystem representations of land surfaces to look directly at the impacts? Over to you, Linda. Thanks, Alan. So good to hear from you. Um, one is I believe there are no plans for looking at uh, the types of interventions you're talking about, but the next phase of Cordex is being developed. So a number of possibilities are being discussed at this point. Um, in terms of the land surface, there have been experiments with changes in land surface and growing crops in regional climate models, but certainly there is, again, not a uniform program uh, to include those types of changes. But again, plans for the next Cortex phase are under discussion. Thank you. All right. Well, now we do have some of the uh, other authors from the book, other uh, uh, developers of the lectures. Um, and um, Manishka, are you, or is, I, we yes. understand Joel Smith and Tim Carter could join. And yes. if there's any other authors, please raise your hands or get in touch with Manishka and we'll put you onto the panel so you could be, be seen and, um, and um, uh, participate in the discussion, uh, which is going to be about where do we go from here, right? The book uh -huh. really encapsulates so much of the field of, of climate impacts and adaptation. But we really now, with the uh, IPCC 
uh, AR6, working groups one and two already out, working group three uh, due report assessment report due out um, next month. Um, at one of the things that's coming from, from the IPCC uh, AR6 is this sense of urgency, that there is the decade of action, basically, that, uh, that all responses uh, to climate change both on mitigation side and, but also um, on adaptation side, need to be ramped up dramatically, really. So the question that we're posing to uh, Linda first, perhaps as, uh, as our first speaker, and as our, as our second speaker in the webinar, and Roger, if you're still on, I'm not sure, but please join as well, um, is what do you feel is, what are the key areas for the science right now as we go into this very much heightened awareness and, and period of action? What science do we need? And I um, see Tim, Tim. Over to you, Linda. What do you think in terms of the science? What's needed the most? I think what is, you know, better, newer science is always a nice thing to have, but I, I think at this point, uh, given the urgency of the problems related to climate change, is that we really need to do work more on um, the types of decision making that must be needed for doing high quality, coming up with high quality uh, adaptation and implementation plans. And this requires more of the integrated approach that um, Roger was talking about. So. The climate models will continue to get better, their resolutions will get better, but I'm personally am much more concerned about us making, or coming up with good decision-making protocols under conditions of uncertainty, because the uncertainty about climate change uh, is never going to go away. And as a matter of fact, we know that in the past, the whole concept of reducing the uncertainty in future climate was actually used as an excuse for not doing anything. The claim that, mm -hmm. oh, it's too uncertain to make any plans. And that's simply not true. And one of the things I always like to discuss in my more public lectures is that we all make decisions about uncertainty all the time and we need to. And certainly I think the last couple of years, um, with COVID certainly demonstrates that uncertainty in certain areas of our lives are always gonna be there and we simply have to deal with it. So that's what I think is most important. Um, as opposed to trying to improve climate science, which will happen anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's my answer. Great, thank Hi, you, Linda. Roger, yeah. over to you sure. as our other webinar speaker, and then we'll Absolutely. open out to the other folks on the panel. And, and, and so, so this is how far we go back. Linda and I were started at a colloquium at NCAR in 1990 on the community oh. climate model. Together. Oh, God. So given that history, I've learned not to disagree with Linda, especially when she's right. <laughs> and in this case, okay. uh, absolutely the case. If I were to say one thing just from the climate standpoint, and this is across the board, is just a better understanding of how the circulation dynamics move where and how the frequency of extremes actually take place, you know, but an understanding of that. But to her point, really getting a stronger sense of, um, of, of the nature of resilience, how we measure it, what actions and policies help encourage that and experimentation over the long term. Um, in addition to this sort of, you know, the varied impacts of shock events and so on are critical. Um, but, but I do think uh, absolutely correct in terms of how we align addressing complex risks, you know, the policy practice and so on. Again, from the climate side, strictly, okay, how, does, how is circulation changing what we understand about where right. wetter gets wetter or dry gets wetter. So, Great. Uh, since you mentioned dynamics, I want to um, introduce David Rind, the co-editor of, um, of the whole series of Our Warming Planet, who gave the lecture on uh, this, the climate change and climate change impacts. David, what do you feel about the dynamics? How is it going on the science in terms of 
uh, understanding better. What what are the, what briefly key key issues there that needs work that need work? You're on mute. One advantage we have over uh, the, what the situation was in previous decades is we've actually seen what's happened over the last 30, 40 years. So we've seen the magnitude of warming we're getting at high latitudes and the magnitude of warming so far we're getting at low latitudes. And as long as we're not talking about time frames too far removed from now, for example, talking about the middle of the century, I think we have an idea of what the trends are in terms of atmospheric dynamics, in terms of storm tracks, in terms of extreme rainfall events. Uh, as was, as uh, Roger was pointing out, we still can't determine where heat waves are going to occur from one time period to, from one summer to the next. And it may be that we'll never know that, that that's part of the nonlinear dynamics of the atmosphere and is probably pretty random. But I think basically, as far as atmospheric dynamics go, sure, we need to do a better job on convection in models. We need to do a better job on understanding the future of, of hurricanes, both the intensity and the storm tracks and things like that. But I think we're actually starting to get in better shape in terms of large scale dynamics, simply by observing what has been going on. And at least for the middle of this century, perhaps just looking at that as a continual trend. Thanks, David. Uh, let me turn now to Tim Carter, who was our, one of our speakers last, uh, our second speaker uh, um, at the launch um, two weeks ago. Tim, thanks so much for joining. And where do you think we need to go? Key areas. Uh, lots of areas, yeah. And, and uh, hi to everybody, all, all my uh, colleagues and friends uh, on the panel and uh, everybody else. But. Uh, yeah, uh, I couldn't agree more with these earlier comments um, on decision decision making. I mean, I, I think I think in a sense that the the focus has shifted a lot over the last few years from the climate science to the areas where it really matters for people, the impacts, the adaptation, how we how we adapt. Obviously, mitigation, and um, there'll be a report coming out on that in IPCC. But I think I think on the impact side. Um, We've been, uh, until quite recently, we've been rather sort of um, uh, sitting back and thinking that uh, we have pretty good tools for estimating how climate change is going to affect uh, different uh, sectors and areas. And, and, and I think uh, we were rather a bit complacent in that. And uh, I think some recent uh, developments where we've been starting to compare our impact models and looking at uh, how, they, how they represent adaptation often very poorly, actually. We don't simulate effectiveness of adaptation very well, with models at least. I think, I think there's a lot more effort needed in some sectors that haven't been well covered. I mean, agriculture has been well covered and even agriculture has its problems in terms of the, um, uh, the ability to estimate and, and, and uh, future, future developments and, and possible future tipping points in, in, in food systems and so on. But there are many other sectors. Uh, we talk about health a lot. We talk, we talk a lot about mortality and heat waves, but there are other health effects as well that involve vectors and, and, and other, other diseases that are also going to be certainly affected by climate change. And uh, we probably don't, don't know very much about some of those. Other sectors as well uh, that, that, that really need to be looked into. Mm -hmm. uh, the built environment, clearly, because that, that's where most people live. So, so I think I think many many areas of impact assessment need to be looked in much more detail, much much more carefully, and uh, models compared, updated, refined, improved. Um, so, well, there are other things, of course, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll close there for the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you, um, Joel. Over to you, and then we'll be wrapping up our, the whole session after yours, uh, for, with a few final thoughts. Um, but Joel, Joel Smith, you had a great. Also, we all worked together on the first national yes. assess, U.S. national assessment. <laughs> um, Linda and, and um, Joel and I, and I'm not sure if Roger was was in on that one or not. Um, yes, so I'm Joel, was <laughs> there. yes, you were. You were right. So the first national climate assessment. So Joel, over to you briefly, what are the, what's the key area that needs to be focused on um, for researchers in, into policy and practice? 
So the problem with your question, Cynthia, is briefly <laughs> because you're <laughs> asking this big picture question in 30 seconds. And, and I think uh, first, hi to everybody. It's interesting. Three people from Boulder, three from New York. And yeah. Tim, are you still in Finland or, or where are you? Are you, <laughs> you know, but uh, Helsing, and we have a smaller yes, population in Boulder to draw from. So um, <laughs> I think and I think David was right about this. We now have we've had 60 some odd years of warming, roughly, you know, more than half a century. We've had a, a lots going on. There's some things we're seeing. There's some things are expected. There's some things that are surprises. I think we need to take on both clearly, and this is happening, but I think both and the science side that Linda covered, and I think the, um, the policy and if, if you will, the human side, I think the Roger covered, you know, we, we need to see what's not just what, you know, what do we, what do the models tell us about the future? What are we learning about actual events? I mean, as an example, you know, it's interesting to see that, and, and David, you could correct me that my understanding is that the models in terms of global temperature are doing pretty well. I mean, Gavin, your colleague Gavin, I think put out a study recently looking at actual emissions and what the models would, would have projected. And they said, gee, they do pretty well. Um, that's interesting. Um, and yet, in terms of observe the direction we're going, maybe there's good news that we're not getting as, you know, maybe we're not heading to that RCP 8.5 scenario, more likely something lower. That's good. On the other hand, it strikes me the earth system may be more sensitive than a lot of us thought. You look at things like fire behavior, you know, some of the tropical cyclone and other things. And I think we need to look also, and I think this is on the adaptation, you know, now we're seeing real events and we see how society, and it is being expressed mainly through extremes, right? Some changes in, in averages, but it really, and, and a lot of people said that would be the case, predicted that would be the case. Mm -hmm. How are we doing as a society? You know, what are we, what are we uh, good at uh, responding to at changing behavior? What are we not so good at? Why is it? What are the barriers? Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, information that we're getting just through, uh, observations and I think I and I'd like to see the assessment still have a way of keep looking forward but I, I think it's good to start putting more and more emphasis on what uh, what we're seeing both physically and I think as in society and in nature too in yeah. terms of uh, responses and what does that tell us how does that better help us better understand uh, our you know understand climate change and its implications great thank you Joel yes. I think research on like, it's like this kind of action research. These things are happening, adaptations are happening. We have to learn. We have to, I think, develop new kinds of research to learn as these, as these things are happening and as we are responding. Um, we're right almost at the top of the hour. I'm turning to Manishka to um, share um, the plans for the next one. Um, and also um, uh, share some work, uh, 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 our link to NASA, uh, which is uh, a key part of this webinar series. So, so Manishka, over to you. Thank you, Cynthia. Just to remind everyone that the book is available for purchase by going to the World Scientific website. And don't forget to use the 30% off discount code. And uh, you can also buy um, the hardcover, the softcover, or the e-version. We also have the first few webinar recordings available on the NOAA CC Run YouTube channel. It's available right now. And then by the end of the week, this will be available on the NOAA CC Run website as well, and we'll continue to update them. And we also um, have a few NASA resources that are relevant to the discussions and the lectures we had today. And I will um, share these also in the chat if I can, uh, but that's the NASA Applied Sciences uh, website on disasters. Then we have the disasters mapping portal, and then we have the GPM precipitation education uh, site as well. So we encourage you to look at these. And then uh, in two weeks, we have two really great webinars coming up as well. We have the Community-Based Adaptation to Climate Change by Faisal Rahman and Salim ul -Haq. And then we have the Impacts of Climate Change on Biodiversity and the Role of Nature-Based Solutions by Pam Berry. So we're really looking forward to that. And then we have uh, 
lots of other exciting lectures coming up over the next few months. Thank you. Over to you, Cynthia, um, for wrap up. Yes, good. Uh, again, thank you to Roger Polwarty and Linda Mearns for their excellent lectures um, on the webinar series and in the book. Um, thanks to David um, lead, helping to lead the whole effort. Thanks to Martin, who's um, who we, we, we who helped to motivate the, the book as well. And Joel and Tim, great to see you. Um, and thanks thanks for your comments. So everything will be posted right on right Manishka on the NOAA CC Run YouTube channel um, uh, shortly. It takes a little bit of time just to break the two apart, um, but we will be there. Um, and um, we look forward to continuing the the webinar series and the discussion. It's it's we really are viewing this as an opportunity for engagement um uh with uh with the community of of uh people working in this area so thanks so much for joining and uh we look forward to seeing you on future webinars thanks a lot bye great thank you Cynthia. and bye. Manishka. bye bye